Good morning. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Hi, church. Good morning. Yeah. So it's been a while since I've been up here, but I'm glad to see everybody. And I'm um, going to talk to you a little bit about the title of my sermon today is 13 Reasons Why Not. Being around, I like to keep my pulse kind of on what's happening in the world today. It's really important so we know how to pray, so we can tend to sheep, so we have an eye and an ear out where people are hurting and suffering. And we know we're in the last days. We know things are terribly traumatic and sad and awful um, if you really are paying attention to the world. And so I accidentally stumbled on... 13 Reasons Why, which is a Netflix series. Um, but I think the timing of it was just right as well because in the month of June, we saw several high-profile people commit suicide in our culture today. So the 13 Reasons Why is about a young girl in high school that commits suicide, and she leaves behind 13 tapes, and it's the reason why. She committed suicide. And as I was watching that, that's when we heard Kate Spade, 55-year-old designer, famous. Her handbags, hundreds of dollars, if not thousands. I'm not quite sure. But um, success, money, fame, beauty didn't help her. 55. We Sid saw a chef, very famous chef, Anthony Bourdain. Who knows him? His fa favorite. He committed suicide, and I believe he was just 51. Then we had Jeannie Popeller, which I'm not sure if you know that, but she's a publicist for The Rich and the Famous, and she committed suicide in June as well. And then Chester Bennington, which is a musician that also committed suicide this um, past June. So as I was watching this and hearing this and painfully watching this 13 Reasons Why, and I don't know how many of you are, have watched it or started watching it and couldn't finish it or whatever. It's very, looking at it sociologically, um, is the only way I could really get through it. it was, it's very painful. But what our youth is dealing with and the lies this world tells them just really compel me to continue watching as they're dealing with so many things we dealt with, but like magnified. I ran out to like 10 or 100 fold. You know, we had teasing. They now have extreme bullying. We had people that made fun of us. They have relentless because of social uh, media. And I think that the famous that, you know, perhaps lose this battle as well to hopelessness and shame and guilt and loneliness, et cetera, um, has a lot to do with not status but it has to do with being lost, right? In a world that you believe the lies of the world. And so we, they get into despair. The World Health Organization say that 800,000 people a year globally kill themselves. That is 40 people, a four, a one person every 40 seconds. And the CDC did a study of what's different in the church. Because in the church, you don't quite see people taking their lives. It's very low statistically and comparatively. So 89, a study of 89,000 people in the study that went and watched and tracked churchgoers every week that participated at service, um, that, that was statistically lower, less than 1%. Then they did a study and they watched 6,999 churchgoers over a decade or so, and not one of them committed suicide. So let's look at some of the things why people do this. And my is titled 13 Reasons Why Not, right? So I'm going to bring you good news. I'm going to share stuff you already know, stuff you're going to hold on to, but maybe you've lost sight of. Because we are living in this world, and we have troubles. We're promised troubles, right? Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And so as we keep our eyes on him, we know we as believers can. But let's see what the world says. The world says, the world says that there's no hope. You are your own hope. Make your own peace, right? It's all about you. You can, you, 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 you. 
There's not another anchor. There's nothing, a life jacket. It says there's no hope. There's no peace. People search for peace and can't find it. They find fame, money, drugs, alcohol, pornography. Nothing is satisfying. Whatever that void is, boyfriends, relationships, it, nothing. Even family sometimes, right? Even extend grandchildren and great-grandchildren is a temporary joy, right? They let you down. They disappoint. We, we know. We're humans. We're, we are um, going to let each other down. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no grace. It's relentless. The mocking that goes on. Nobody extends grace. There's no compassion, right? One mistake, and you're on the news over and over and over and over, and now you're in each other's homes through Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram and those, and you could just be targeted, feeling like there's no escape. There's no truth, right? Truth is relative, your truth is not my truth. There's no truth. It's what you're, whatever you make of it, right? And so they say there's no truth. There's no absolutes. And I think people long for that. There's no goodness. So, they, so when you're in this state, for sure you don't feel it. We can point to many things good in the world. But when depression and loss and feeling lonely overshadow, there is no goodness. There's no patience. People are... Ugh, extremely everything's fast hurry up hurry up hurry up up. next 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 right move on get over it (sighs) you know you want to you want to talk to your friend get over counseling session okay so how are you doing oh you know my heart's heavy they start showing so okay well let me tell you what i'm doing right we don't stop slow down we don't listen we pass by oh good i'm glad you're fine right on okay and that was what's so tragic about tragic about this series is because this girl had 13 really close friends or people that she knew that she had friendship, and nobody knew, not even her own parents, what was going, how she was internalizing the things going on in her own life, right? So I think we need to slow down. There's no patience. We don't have time for mistakes, right? You say something wrong, you're fired in this culture too, right? (laughs) There's no mercy, no protection, nowhere to go, no sanctuary, no freedom, no sense of community, no plans for eternity, and no love, which I think is what the one that ultimately gets people, right? You just feel like nobody loves me, nobody cares, no one's going to hold me up. Well, I understand all these things. I was a teenager that had suicidal thoughts, suicidal tendencies. I suffered and I was popular and beautiful, athletic, straight-A student. I could do everything. So it has nothing to do with my success. It was nothing to do with my popularity. I didn't get bullied. I didn't get picked on. But there was something in me. And I suffered. And oh my gosh, I wanted to end my life more times than I would care to admit. But it wasn't until I found hope and I understood And I was even a Christian, knew a little bit. I wasn't raised in the church, but a coach that led me to the Lord through um, outreach. And still, so when I say that the church is different, we're talking about people that spend time with the Lord, go to church. They're sowing a relationship within the community and within um, the with the Lord. Like he, it's not religion. We're talking relationship. So I understand. And watching that show and hearing of these famous people, and maybe you know somebody. I know I do. I had a friend, dear friend, that tried to drive his car off, or did not try, drove his car off the cliffs right here in um, in, uh, Palos Verdes to end his life. Car went crashing, hit the water. And the surfers he surfed with every day saved his life. He ended up committing suicide by cop a few years later, um, right up in PV in front of his parents' home. So, but he was tormented. He was tortured. He, He knew the Lord. He loved the Lord. And he had tragedies he just couldn't get over. He just couldn't get over. He had a wife that was murdered, and he could not get over that he had a home invasion and she was murdered and he wasn't home and why he was left behind and he suffered and even him sowing into the Lord, even him spending time, he still, still got lost. And that's why it's important that I'm going to go over why 
we have hope, that we can look and we can reflect on what we have and maybe areas we need to maybe dive in a little bit deeper with the Lord to get that, to get what he promises us because his promises are true. So um, I know these things up close and personal and maybe some of you do too. And by God's grace, I'm here. And by God's grace, I was not foolish, right? Thank you, Jesus. So let's see what these 13 reasons why not are and how I can encourage you today. So the world says hopelessness, we say hope. We have, and the hopelessness is a feeling or state of despair. There's just a lack of hope. Hope, a feeling of expectation, a desire for a certain thing to happen. A feeling of trust, someone or something that may be able to provide help to trust in or to wait for. Now, there's hundreds of scriptures on all of these. I'm gonna, it was so hard to pick just a few. So I'm going to encourage you to write down the ones and do a, a word study. Go and search your concordance, search the scriptures to find out what speaks to you. But these are ones that um, really stood out and are, and are really... Um, Zeroing in on what I'm trying to sow here today. So Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who hope in the Lord will what? You know this one. Renew their strength, and they will soar on eagles', eagles wings. They will run and not grow tired, and they will walk, and they will not faint. Right? And then Romans 12, 12, 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulations. Be constant in prayer. We got to re- we got to rejoice in the hope and be patient through the trials. That's what it's telling us. They're going to pass. Doesn't feel like it. A lot of times, seasons get really long. I know those seasons. You just see, there's no end in sight. That's when we put our hope because hope is what trusting and waiting for something or someone. We have the someone. We have the God of the universe, the lover of our soul, the creator of all things, dwelling in us. And if he's not, you can receive him today. Dwelling in us, that will remind us. That's why memorizing scripture is so important. Because when we're lost, broken, guess what? You don't have to think about that scripture. The Holy Spirit will bring it to you to rescue you to get you out of your situation, to remind you, to encourage you, to lift you up. And then Romans 15, 13, may God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You may abound in hope that God is going to fill you up with hope so you can abound in it, right? It's not something we have to stir up. But it's something we have to practice and something we have to put our focus on the one, the hope, the hope, Jesus Christ, the person. And then, the, excuse me, then the next one, Jeremiah 29, 11, we can all recite this. I'm pretty sure about 90% of you probably knows. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm, to harm you, plans to give you hope. And a future, right? Suicidal people, those depressions that, you know, when we're that, under that much oppression, they're believing the lies of the enemy. They're coming in. They forget that there is a future. He says, I'm going to give you a hope and a future. Not promise you no trials. Not promise you no pain. Not promising there's no suffering. But he has a plan. And you're part of that. And then number, the next one. Peace versus distress, or distress versus peace. The world brings distress, and that is extreme anxiety, sorrow, or pain. The opposite of distress is peace, and that's what Jesus gives us. The freedom from disturbance, quiet, tranquil. Have you ever been in a trial so heavy, and yet somehow you have peace, and you're like, but I have peace, right? I have peace. The world might be crashing on, but for some reason, like the sun is shining on me. I just feel like wherever I step, oh, for here. <laughs> you know, that's the peace of the Lord, and that's what he gives. He tells us he gives it. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit, 
right? It's the byproduct of giving your life to the Lord. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit that as we mature, as we stay faithful, as we remain in him, he gives us that peace. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. As members of one body, you were called to peace. And John 16, 33, I told you these things that you may have peace. And that's what I quoted earlier. You know, I'll tell you things that you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And then in 1 Corinthians it says, For God is not a God of disorder, of disorder but a God of peace. These things are in a person. These things are the person, right? These are the attributes of God. He is the gift giver, so he gives us that peace. He is the hope. He is peace. And then sprinkled all throughout scripture, which I love, which I love. I love reading the, um, the beginning and the end of um, all the gospels. They always say, grace and peace be with you. Grace and peace be with you. So it's scattered in there. It's so important to share grace and peace with them, to remind us grace and peace and hope and love is ours. And I'm just reminding you that we hold these truths. We have them in the person of Jesus Christ. And then the world, we, the Lord gives us joy, but the opposite of joy is agony. And agony leads to despair. And agony is extreme physical or mental suffering. Have you ever just been felt in agony? I have. I know that. Extreme physical or mental suffering that just, like there's nowhere. You just feel like it's just closing in. But the joy the joy God gives. It says joy is a feeling of great pleasure, of happiness. You can't find joy in the world. There's only one place to get it. You cannot get joy from doing anything. You can get happiness. You can even find some contentment temporarily. But joy is also a fruit of the Spirit. And that is a gift from God. <clears throat> it's a gift from God. So what does the scripture say about joy? Luke 1.14. He will be a joy. Who's he? Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. Right? That's what we're, that's what we're looking at. We're like, we were anticipating the Messiah. We anticipate finding and filling our lives up with where that void is always, right? Billy Graham's son says, Franklin Graham says, every person is born with a void. Every person, and the only thing that can fill it is Jesus Christ. And that's why this scripture is so true. He will be your joy. He's coming, his birth, and of course, his death and resurrection, which gave us eternal life. And then Acts 13, 52 says, And the disciples, disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So it's real important that you listen today. You're, you're doing a, a spirituality check on yourself. You're saying, hmm, she's talking about, I kind of know what she's talking about. How come I don't really know joy or peace like that? That means you probably don't have the Holy Spirit. You might believe God. You might think you know God. You might hang out at church and say, I understand, and you get it here. But he's got to enter here. There's got to be that connection. You've got to receive the Holy Spirit. He has to come upon you. It's free for the offering. He will never tell you no. Nope. You're not good enough there, Meg. Sorry. Less. Nope. Not you. But I'm holding that Holy Spirit back from you. No. So if I'm talking about things and you're going, I don't understand it to that degree right? To that, I mean, I don't have to think about being joyful. I don't have to think about finding peace. I'm not searching for it. It just is on me in search situations. And it is weird when your life, you can be miserable and yet you're like <gasps> crying or at prayer service. Oh, I'm going through this. I went through that. But in the midst of those tears, you're like, you ever calm. There's a peace in that drama or in that. And I say that because I'm dramatic, but there is a peace that you can't explain. There's a joy and a hope that you can't explain, even in the worst of times. And then it says, um, what is, the next one is, 
Harshness versus grace. You know, I didn't even know what the antonym of grace was. I was like, what's the opposite of grace? And I found out it was harshness. And I'm like, oh, makes sense. But I really didn't know what it was. So let's look. Harshness is the quality of being unpleasantly rough or jarring to the senses. The quality of being cruel or severe. Total opposite of our Lord. That's what the world gives our children. That's what the workplace gives. That's what Hollywood dishes out to one another. Politics dishes it out to one another. Harshness, cruelty, severe, jarring to the core. Right? And people that don't have that void filled up by Jesus Christ in them find themselves believing what? The lies. Believing the lies. Finding no way out. It's haunting them. But we have what? Grace. We walk in grace. We have grace every moment to cover us that it can just like what? Kind of roll off us. Kind of just go, you know what? I know I had a little rough patch with Susan or I know my boss got mad at me at work, but you know what? I'm good. We're all good. Because I know I walked and did the best I can and I'm going to believe God's word and I'm going to walk upright and I'm going to make sure I'm being truthful in those situations, whatever it is, and I'm going to be humble and I'm going to repent and I'm going to ask for forgiveness and I'm going to do all the things that the Lord has taught me so that I am a true disciple and over the, and then I know I already have grace from him, right? He says, those who forgive and much, forgive much. And I know what I've been forgiven for. So it's easy for me to just go, you know what? Mm. All right, I'm sorry. Let's make this better. And so grace is free, an unmerited favor, a state of being sanctified by God, being under divine influence. These are definitions. I didn't make these definitions. These are the definitions. So even the world who writes the definitions for us, right, knows that grace is a state of being under sanctification by God. Meaning you can't find it anywhere else. <laughs> They're not offering it. They're not selling it. They're not giving it. They don't want to give it. It'll be short-term fake. They will remember every wrong thing you ever did. Yep. Right? But grace, oh, grace brings me unto a sanctification with God. There is a, a forgiveness I receive in the midst of making the same mistake. Oh, I did it again. I did it again. God's like, you're under my grace and I adore you. And I adore you. You're being, you are being influenced by, a, by divinity, by God, the divine. We forget, right? We say unmerited favor, but by who? Where's it coming from? You didn't get unmerited favor by your spouse, right? <laughs> You're not getting unmerited favor by your best friend or your next door neighbor. Uh-uh. And if they are giving it to you, it's because they have the Holy Spirit and they can forgive you entirely and never bring it up again. Again. Grace. I love that. So the... Um, the scriptures that go with grace, and there are so many, so pick some of these, go through them, discuss the ones that are on your heart at your um, peer groups this week, in your, in your, around your dinner table tonight, during the week. Ask your kids. So, love, faith, hope, which one do you struggle with? <laughs> right? Do you have joy? Are you trying to find it? Right? So these can be starting conversations so you can, you know, test the temperature of your friends and family as well. So Zechariah 12, 10 says, And I will pour out on the house of David and its inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace. So this is years before Jesus comes. The Father God is pouring out that grace. And as we came to know what his son did and we get grafted into that promise, we are part of the house of David. We get to be into that lineage. We get to have that grace poured over us. Don't forget, you have that unmerited favor with the only one that counts. Yes, we want our bestie to stay our bestie. We want our relationships to be perfect. But when everything, when all the chips are down, are you right with God? Are you living under his grace? Do you know it? Are you finding peace in the midst of turmoil? 
And then John 1, 14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one, the only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Full of grace. And it can, even though he keeps pouring it out, it will never run dry, right? He's the everlasting fountain, never going to run dry. And John 1, 16 says, out of his fullness, we have all, all, everybody say all. all. And Kurt always says, all means all. all. We have all received grace in place of God, of grace given already. You've received grace in place of grace, because even though you were separated from God, even though you said, you still had it, you still could draw on that. So he says, I'm giving you grace upon the grace that you already have gotten now that you know who I am and I am the God of grace. So let me just keep pouring it over on you. Come get back in the shower. I'm going to just keep dousing you. Do you ever just, do you ever just like stay in the shower? Just like, I'm not getting out. <laughs> just, just, just fall under that. Just, ah, oh, okay. I'm going to stand under this grace right now. I am never getting out from this place, Lord. Ah, oh, I'm going to give you grace where there already was grace. That is so beautiful and powerful. And then John 1, 17 says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and the truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses. They can have the law. That's Old Testament, Old Covenant. We're under the New Covenant. We're under what Jesus has done. And that is grace. That is grace. Now, um, what question did Paul pose? Should we sin because we got grace? Can I sin more? Uh, no. If you understand grace, you're, like, you're not even, so that shows you they were such babies. If you understand grace, that's not even the question. You were just like, ah, oh, love you more. You'd be like, you're more like um, Isaiah, woe is me, right? Woe is me that I should fall under such power, that I should have that gift because I am nothing but filthy rags, but oh my glory to God. Not like, Covered by grace, I'm going to go do whatever we do and think it's going to be all right because no one's watching. He's watching. He knows. And he's gracious. But don't test God. Just thank him. Turn, repent, and understand that that grace, although it's free, it is something that can, you can abuse. He might call you out on it. It might just, you know, but... We don't want to do that. We want to continue to just know who he is, who is grace, not, and not as much what grace is, but who is the grace giver. And then <clears throat> lies versus the truth. We know that what? The Nick, one of the names of Satan is what? He's a liar, deceiver. Lie means to make untrue statements with the intent to deceive, Right? The intent to deceive. So we know that Jesus is truth. And that is the quality. Truth is the quality of being true. Genuine. Actual. Factual. And as I so graciously learned in grad school, that truth is a person. It's not a concept. So truth is Jesus and so we always want to say your truth, my truth. It's relative. There's nothing relative about it. He is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Just as the deceiver is the liar. He's the father of lies. And we may serve him knowingly or unknowingly. But when we're lying to one another, deceiving one another, trying to get gain from telling lies, trying to hurt one another, believing the lies, we are slave to the father of lies, which is Satan. And Jesus says, or um, Ephesians 1.13 says, and so you were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And that's what I'm talking about. These things come through the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the ideas, the concepts we can we can get them through our mind, but when we understand them, when the heart and the mind connects and the soul and, and Christ's spirit dwells in us, we understand them with no explanation. We just get it because you're receiving it, right? Just like driving a car. I have no idea how I'd put it all together, but I get the gift. I can drive the car, right? I get in it. It works. I'm stoked. 
just like that. Jesus, if we're not understanding these things, if we're not understanding why I don't feel peace, why I don't have hope, why, why do I believe lies so e- easy? The Holy Spirit will decipher these things. He tests the spirits. He knows the truth. He will help you follow the truth. And then 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, Who want all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? So we want all to be saved through the knowledge of the truth. We're lost until we have that knowledge. And the world so easily believes lies. You don't even get a chance to explain yourself. You can't even have a moment where you just flub, right? There's no grace. They're just going to automatically, because they're such liars, think that maybe you're a liar too, and what you say couldn't be accidental or misspoke or whatever. Just it's a lie. You're a liar. You're a liar, right? Just bring them down. Bring them down so that I could build myself up, right? We don't have to do that in the church. We don't tear each other down to build each other, to build ourselves up. So the lie with the truth. Okay, next one. Wickedness versus goodness. The qual- wickedness is the quality of being evil or morally wrong, very bad. Goodness, the quality of being good, moral, honest, virtuous. Words we don't hear too much, right? Moral, honest, virtue. Things uh, 100 years ago they aspired to, right? 200 years, definitely. Today, eh, there's no morality. Oh, heaven help us. The things we see on TV, live TV. Ooh, we <laughs> just walk in Walmart. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> right here at the beach. There's too much immorality, dishonesty, and unvirtuous things happen. So we have to what? Be salt and light of this culture. We have to bring those things to let people know what it looks like. And guess what? It's attractive. People know you're different. They might be living a life of debauchery. But when they say goodness, they're kind of curious. They don't know what to think. What is this? At first, they're not going to trust you that it's really you, right? Because they think everything's a lie. Everybody's a deceiver, right? So virtue, honest, morality, goodness. Be good. Goodness is a fruit of the Spirit again. So goodness, surely goodness and love will follow me. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. And then it says, celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Those are both from Psalms. So goodness. And again, there's so many, hundreds for each of these. I mean, each of these scripture. So just take your time, go through them, and look and see how the word of God speaks to you. But we definitely don't see goodness. And when we do, we like it. Only it doesn't make news. So you don't see it as much as you should. Okay? Because it's more what? Tantalizing the one that, you know, the, the, the prince of this air, right? He's the one, like, taking control of those airwaves. So we've got to be like, you know what? We need to see more good things. More puppy videos. I don't know. <laughs> or as my stepdad loves cat videos. Oh my gosh, don't get me on, what's his name? Grumpy cat. That cat makes like $30 million a year. I don't understand. Anyway, <laughs> I wish Grumpy cat knew about water wells for Africa. That's all I know. <laughs> okay, impatient versus patience impatience. The world, again, is impatient. Hurry up. There's no time. You should have that done yesterday, right? We don't, have to, we don't even let our kids go through normal, natural stages anymore. I was a teacher. Some of you are teachers. You know they want to rush them through because we want to say, check, 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 check. They know this. They can't even comprehend what you're show, teaching them now. They're not at that level. There's a natural process of growth, Right? intellectually, physically, emotionally, but we're, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, right? So having to, having impatience, having or showing a tendency to be quickly irritated. Anybody ever feel quickly irritated? Yep, not me. (laughs) Provoked, provoked. Oh yeah, the, the world loves to provoke, provoke. Intolerant of, and they claim tolerance. You know, I don't know. We better, you know, check that thermometer, get a compulsive. Our um, 
of our culture, they always are saying tolerance, tolerance, but it's impatience. They're constantly impatient. And they're restlessly eager, right? I, I got to do it. God says, no, you got to re- just step back. No, no, I got to do it. No, got to rest. Okay, and then patience, able to tolerate delays. How many of you are able to tolerate delays? I got a lot of honest Christians here, right on. Okay, good. Some of you are. I love it. But you know what? That's about right. Statistically right. One hand goes up in a room full this size. I believe that. (laughs) Able to tolerate delays. Able to tolerate problems. Um, Suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. I love suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. I wish I would do it more often. But I have had seasons where I suffered without being annoyed or anxious. And then I've had the last two years. So, um, (laughs) some of you right beside me. (laughs) Not pointing anything out to me. Thank you, Doug. Anyway, (laughs) patience is this. It is also what? A fruit of the Spirit. Okay, Lord, grow that fruit in me. I need some patience from your tree. Okay, anyway, um, Second Timothy says, you have, uh, you, however, know all about my teachings, the way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance. So I love that. That one spoke to me. I do know all about it. Up here, I know a lot about it. <laughs> Help me, Lord, with being more patient and agon- with agonizing situations and not be anxious for anything. And that is a fruit of the Spirit. James 5.10 says, patience in the face of sufferings. You will have patience in the face of suffering. That's what God gives us. We cannot give ourselves patience. If you try to, try to be patient, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be patient. And you try yourself to be patient. And for some reason, your blood pressure goes up. Maybe your skin turns redder or hotter or whatever. Because you're trying so hard to be patient. Keep looking at the time. Tapping your foot. Yeah, I'm patient. Now I'm going to be patient in this situation. I'm not going to say anything. Okay. So we want to be patient in the face of suffering. And we can. We not only want to be, we can. That's what the Word of God tells us. We can. Okay. Second Peter 3.15. Bear in mind that the Lord's patient means salvation. Ow! Yeah. How long did you have to wait to get the Lord's salvation? Were you 10? You didn't have to wait for long. 20, 30, 40, 50, right? Now we have it. So patience is the Lord's salvation. Yes, I understand. I don't have to be anxious or anything because God's got it. What a concept. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I love him. All right. Punishment. Next one. The world likes to punish. But... Mercy. I didn't know what the opposite of mercy was either. It's a weird word, right? We hear those terms all the time, very Christianese, you know, mercy, grace. So the opposite of mercy is punishment, which I didn't realize. And it's the affliction or imposition of a penalty as, re- as a retribution for an offense. Wow. A penalty inflicted. Wow. Aren't you glad for God's mercy because we don't get anything we deserve right? You might think, oh, why are you doing this to me, Lord? Why am I going through this? Why did I lose my job? Why is my flat car flat, my tire flat on my car? Why did Bob give me that look? Why? (laughs) Bob didn't do anything to me. Just kidding. Um, So why? We always like, right? He said, it's an, we get in, a, a penalty for a thing we did wrong. It's a punishment. God says, no, he has mercy. And mercy is compassion or forbearance, unmerited favor, a blessing that is an act of divine favor of compassion, right? Compassionate treatment for those in distress. Why would you not choose Jesus? I can't figure out this crazy world. Why? It's free. You get all this good stuff. Uh, Compassion, right? Blessings. That is an act of divine favor. Holy cow. What am I doing suffering? Why am I not opening my mouth and telling people about this? That's the other thing we have. And we're like, can't share with anybody. 
<gasps> too scared. Why would they want to know there's patience and there's deliverance and there's freedom and there's passion and there's mercy? That's pretty scary stuff. What? What's wrong with us? We're looking at it wrong. Don't keep the genie in the bottle, as they say, right? So, compassionate treatment for those in distress. How many of you were in distress before you knew God? Oh, yeah. Some of you accidentally found him. Hallelujah. You were, he kind of came by surprise. You were like, okay, I was ready. Here I am. But some of us were in distress. And he's like, here I am. Mercy in the flesh. Right? Mercy in the flesh. Our Lord lives. Don't forget, he lives. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He never died. He died, but then <laughs> he rose again. <laughs> okay, so. <clears throat> I, oh, the scriptures for mercy. David said, I'm in deep distress. First Chronicles and in Second Samuel, this same quote. I'm in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall into the hands of man. Wow, that says everything we need to know. Wow, if only we knew this when we saw a loved one that was suffering. Don't let you fall into the hands of man. Fall into the hands of the Lord because he is merciful. I know what the world's going to give me. Harshness, harshness. They're going to give, they're going to afflict more pain on me when I'm suffering. They're not going to come in with compassion and scoop me up, right? So mercy. The Lord has heard my cries for mercy. You know he hears your cries for mercy? Just like you hear your children's cry for mercy, right? Some people um, even hear their children cry spiritually. They're in another state and they know their child is suffering or being tormented or in a bad accident. And they just know they're woken up in the night. God knows. If a human can do that by God's spirit, that they're so connected to that loved one. You're his child. You're his son. You're his daughter. Proclaim that you are. And he knows. He hears our cry for mercy. But do we keep it in? I'm just going to hold it in. I'm just going to suffer through this. No. Stop suffering alone. Let Jesus help you. Let us help you. Be reminded of these good things. He heard my cry for mercy throughout the Psalms. Heard my cry for mercy. Here's my cry for mercy. And he comes to my rescue. And he comes to my rescue. Thank you, Jesus. And then Ephesians 2, 4 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy. He not only is mercy, has mercy. He's rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. He's rich in compassion. He's rich in blessings. He's going to keep us, pull like us out of distress. Are we going to maybe still be in the same situation? Yes, but he's going to lift us out of it spiritually, sometimes fully. Woohoo! I love when he rescues us like that, but sometimes we have to go through it, walking through it, holding God's hand, keeping our eye on him, right? Maybe you're in the storm, and you're like Peter out on the water. Don't take your eyes off Jesus, right? Don't start sinking. Hold on to all the things you know are true. And then 1 Timothy 1.13, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief, right? I hear the confusion of this all the time. God's going to forgive us. He's absolutely going to forgive us even when we act in ignorance and unbelief, Right? then we need to show mercy to those that are unsaved and acting in ignorance and unbelief. They don't know better. The church, we have a higher standard. People are, I'm not judging. I can't judge. Yes, I can. I can go to my cousin. She's a Christian. I can say, Dallas, here's the deal. I can iron sharp and iron. I can help encourage her in her walk if she's falling short in an area. That's appropriate. I'm allowed to judge her. She knows better. She has Christ. I want her to use the tools Christ has given her right? And I'm going to encourage her in thing. Am I judging like, judge? No. Calling somebody out, approaching somebody, rebuking them, correcting them is loving in the body. Holding the world responsible for foolishness is foolishness from you. They don't know better. They acted in ignorance. And we have to know, oh, so what do we do? We want to pray them. We're hoping for that dialogue. We're hoping for that moment to tell them about all this good, delicious stuff that Jesus has to offer them. They don't have to. 
what? Sell their bodies. They don't have to be a slave to alcohol, drugs. They don't have to run away, disown people, disinherit people. They don't have to hate one another, be unforgiving. They don't have to feel hopelessness. They don't have to hurt people, right? Bully people. They don't. But we're not to judge those. They don't know, right? So my friend of mine had a, and they went to their pastor, and it was so wise. I thought this was a good move. She had these two friends that are a lesbian couple, and they were going to get married or something. She said, and so she went to the pastor, and she said, Pastor, should, I don't know, you know, because she's a Christian, should I go to the wedding? And he's like, well, you're lo- you love the, the people, not the sinner. You go and be that light. You go and support the person, we always want to go, no, can't. And yes, there is a fine line, but what is your motivation for going? Staying in their life so they can have the only person that, may, that they may ever see or know that's a true Christian? Believe me, they're going to get married, they're going to have problems. They probably have tons of problems already. Anybody who's married has problems. Anybody that's in a relationship has problems. I don't care what your, whatever that is. Like, forget what they call it now. They have so many letters and numbers, I don't know what it is. LBG2Q something. I don't know. Whatever that all means. But relationships are hard. Having a best friend is hard, right? Maintaining family affairs are hard. So we want to, you know, want to use wisdom. Are you saying, yes, I support? It's where, where your, what your purpose is and letting them know. You know what? You know, I don't believe this. They knew her. They know, she, they know how she felt. But her pastor gave her wise advice. And then she has to decide, can I do it with that motivation? Am I able to? And that's what we need to do. We can't, we have to show Grace and mercy because we have ignorance, right? We have ignorance and unbelief. They are acting in ignorance. And he said, even though I was a blasphemer. Okay, the next one. Attacking versus um, protection. We have protection. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy cow, thank you, Lord. Oh, I can't even tell you how many times he's protected me from everything under the sun. So let's see attacking. What does attacking mean? To take aggressive action against. To act against. To take aggressive action against. Oh, I get so tired of watching aggressive action against our president, against one another, against Christian actors versus non-Christian actors, against uh, the Muslims and the, and the um, Jews and the Muslims in the world and the Christians and the neighbor, I don't know, we just, we just take so much aggressiveness and action, but we're supposed to, we have protection, we're supposed to walk in that protection, we're supposed to be a refuge, as Jesus is a refuge, you are supposed to be a refuge for somebody in need or in crisis, not making the situation worse, and so protection is a person, you, yes, you, you could be a protector, Jesus is our protector, our provision, a person or thing that prevents someone or something from suffering harm or injury. We can be that lighthouse. We can be that breakwater, right? We can help as just as the Lord has protected us. He is our protection. Psalm 46, one says, God is our refuge and our strength and everlasting presence in trouble. That's right, in trouble. Numbers 35, 25 says, may the Lord bless and protect you. When it says may he bless and protect you, he is blessing and protecting you. That's not to be like, he might, he might not, okay? May he protect, no, it means he will go. He's going to protect you. May he always protect you. It's not a question, it's not a hope, it is that he will protect you. And First um, Samuel 2, 9, he will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. You can't do it alone. Even if you're a Christian, you can't do it alone. We're not designed to do this walk alone. We're not designed to be the lone Christian outsider. We need to be in the sheepfold. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We need to be getting encouragement. We need to come and get fed weekly. Just like the studies were showing, people that stay in the body, stay in fellowship, stay in the word, um, reach out to the church and attend and hear positive information, stay are healthier. And those statistics I quoted earlier had nothing to do with mental illness too. It was 
fair game anyone. Didn't have to do anything with your sexuality, your gender, your race, your creed. 800,000 people a year commit suicide. Doesn't matter the age, the color, where they live. It's worldwide. Every 40 seconds, one person. Right? Despair it can hit, hit anybody. Hopelessness, anybody. But there's only the one solution. All right. <clears throat> so protection. He will protect his faithful ones. I did that. And then Matthew 26, 33. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for a thousand angels to protect us? And he would send them instantly. I love that. Do we live like that? I know some of you do. I got a few over on this side. This side, are we living that way? Do you know? Yeah. Summer's going, yeah, I know it. He, he, I, he, I'm, you know, so he's telling him, I, my God, I can ask him right now. He's kind of boasting a little bit. I'm going to ask him right now, and he would instantly. So do we ask him? Or do we wait till we're totally drowning? Ah, give me the lifeline. Ah, no, Lord, I need you now. I need you now. And then Luke 4.10 says, For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you. Do not worship angels, by the way. Okay. Just be careful. 90s, we had a lot of angel worshiping going on. We want to worship one God. <laughs> the angels are his messengers. They do protect us. They have a purpose. But we don't have to bow down to them and exalt them and wear them around our necks. They're in the spirit realm. God's got them. He's in control of them. He'll send them to you. Just ask him. He's watching over you. All right. And then <clears throat> captivity versus freedom. Captivity. I was captive. Who were you, what, and who were you captive to before you knew Christ? The enemy. Yeah, Susan just nailed it. The enemy. <laughs> no matter what I was doing, the enemy. I was captive. I was imprisoned. I was confined. That's why you commit, people commit suicide. You're confined to a place that you see no way out. You're a captive of your circumstance, of your mind, of lies, right? And I like how Susan, to the enemy, you're just captive. And he is the one that enslaves. And, but we have what? Freedom. Freedom, the power, a right to act, to speak, think as one wants without hindrance or resistance. We're losing this freedom every day, freedom every day. Be bold. Trust the Lord will protect you. Stay honest. Be wise. But believe what is right. Believe what is so. Put, your, put all your eggs in the basket of truth. Yes. That's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. He will defend us. He will protect us. And remember, we're not afraid of death anyway. Kill me what? Ever. Right? I have a hope. If that's what you got, Go ahead. What? Right? Because freedom is from the Lord. And it's very important that we understand that we don't have to hide, that we can be bold. We can stand up because we have one that's going to defend us and protect us as we stand on the truth and the word of God. <clears throat> All right. So what are those scriptures for freedom? Freedom. Out of my distress, I call on the Lord. This is Psalm 91. Um, verses 14, 15. Out of my distress, I call on the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. Hallelujah. I've loved when he's done that. I've been an emotional, ah! and all of a sudden it's like, oh, thanks, Lord. Wow, wow. Just like that, you just washed my tears away, right? And Psalm 18, 118.5, I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. So, see, you have to know his precepts. You can't just be ignorant in this. You have to know. It's about spending time with him, that relationship, palling around with him, walking his mercy, knowing his grace, knowing the truth, knowing his love, knowing there's hope. That's all him. You got to spend the time with him so that you, so it says, I, you, you, I can walk in freedom because I have sought out your precepts. That's your laws. That I means I've studied you. I know who you are. I know who you are in my life. And therefore, I can be free in any situation. Never Never feel captive, never feel oppressed, never feel like I have to keep my mouth shut when I see injustice, when I see, you know, hurts and torments and torture and sin. I don't have to. I can, I can be sound-minded. I can speak and be wise and offer a solution because I have the, dwell, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in me. I don't have to remain foolish. I have freedom, the freedom 
that, that knows what I know is true and there's power in the truth, right? And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. All right, and then finally, almost finally, we are heirs. Do you forget that? We some of us walk around, we're like this, huh? We forget, we feel like just, you know, like we have no hope, there's no one. Whatever our circumstances, I'm just not wearing the right clothes. I don't have the right car. I, I don't know. I don't know. And we forget we're heirs. This life will pass. Everything in it is going to be gone. You know I work hospice. Not one person could take any of that stuff with them. That's right. And they know it at the end. Nothing. Some of them get so overwhelmed how much stuff they have because nothing is going with them. Nothing. And a lot of them don't know where they're going. But we have confidence because we are heirs to the throne. Because we are part of a community. Who are you reaching out to? Who are you calling upon in your time of weakness, in your distress? Calling on the name of the Lord alone, great. Love you. Let him minister to you. But if you're calling a friend who's unsaved, you are foolish. Call somebody in your community that understands that can offer you the truth in love and help to build you up and point you back to the cross. Point you to his saving grace and the knowledge that he has. We have an eternal inheritance, an internal inheritance. So this life, right, passing through, whatever it happens here, it's all going to be left behind, and we will be and dwell in the house of the Lord. We are part of his family. We are adopted. We are grafted in. I don't know how many ways I can say this. We are accepted and received. We are his children. Do you feel like his child? Do you know you're his child? Did you have a bad parent? It's not that parent. This is God. Okay? So don't confuse your papa that you were raised with. That probably was not very good. Maybe you had a great dad. Awesome. But if you had a great dad, he's even more awesome. If you had a lousy dad, don't even think of that dad. This dad, you can trust. This God dad won't abandon you. This dad has plans for you and a hope and a future. And he wants to build you up. And he says, if my child asked for bread, I would never give him a stone, right? I'm not going to be harsh with you. I got mercy and grace, right? I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to give you peace over that. I'm going to rescue you from that. So we are his heirs. And then we have eternity. Those that commit suicide, they do not think of what happened next. They think the end, just get me out of this pain. There's nothing else. I'm going to just end it. Because there's nothing else. They don't even think for a minute an eternity. Because if you thought for a moment for an eternity, you would stop. Because then you have to go, hmm, what if there is a God? What if there is? Where will I spend it? Will I be tortured? Is there heaven? Is there hell? So we have eternity. Eternity is, is infinite or unending time. A state which time has no application. Timelessness. Endless life after death. Now, the words that came up that were um, antonyms for this were like, um, a moment, <laughs> um, a nanosecond, <laughs> okay? This, I mean, we have eternity. This is not a word the world uses. Everything's here now, fast, tomorrow, go. They always think tomorrow. We think, we don't think tomorrow. We should be thinking, we're not sowing in Africa diligently because we're worried about the 10,000 people that are right there. No, worry about the 10,000 generations that come after them. We're helping those now, but we have a vision that they will have clean water, not just for tomorrow, but for until the Lord comes back. Where, how are you sowing? Are you suffering in a job just to pay your bills and you're like, no, God might have another calling on you and you're like so worried about now that you're forgetting how am I supposed to sow into eternity? Where do I fit in eternity now? And where am I going to go? So eternity is powerful. And it helps us to have more strength here because we know this is such a small amount of time, even if you live to be 92 like Nikki. Still a small amount of time. Not enough time, huh, Nikki? So many more things to do. You need more time, don't you, Nikki? Do you need more time? Yep. 105. <laughs> 105. Yes, glory to God. Yes, she wants to be 105. So we have eternity. Start living your life based on that. If I pass this person on the street, how will that change my eternity? Not change your eternity, but how is that affecting my eternal 
thought? Am I sowing into eternity? John, John, uh, the apostle John wrote a lot about eternity in mind. Go back and read um, through the book of John. He's always thinking eternal. Our heads should be in things that were so in eternity. And, and Kurt's a really good example of that. Pastor Kurt is a really good example. That Start listening to him. He's not for talking about temporal stuff. It's always what's going to be in the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Yes. Right? So he's a really good example of how, what that looks like. Kingdom-minded. That's the phrase. So Isaiah 4. I'm going to use 43, 13. From eternity to, to eternity, I am God. No one can snatch anyone from my hand. No one can undo what I have done. Amen. Right? Amen. That's right. And then finally, we have love. I'm not going to leave out love. You're probably going, why don't you start with love? Because love is the thing that it all hinges on. God is love. Love is the one that guards us. Love is the one that should move us. Love is the thing that we should be, be motivating us. The world looks for love. Unfortunately, they find it in so many wrong ways. So many wrong ways do they find love. And I don't need to share any of those ways with you. You already know it. So, because um, some of us did the same things and looked in the same directions and we didn't find it until we found Jesus, and then we're like, oh, wow, this is love. This is like nothing I've ever seen. And John 1, 1 John 4, 8 says, whoever does not love does not know God. So if you're struggling and you are not loving, you're not loving your neighbor, you're finding it kind of repelling to just love anybody, you're kind of isolate, but you come to church, you're like, cool, church, I did my duty check. Okay, run out, don't talk to anybody, nobody look at me, I'm just... That's not loving. Love. Are you extending hand? Are you helping out? Are you giving your times and talents to places? That's a measure of the heart. That's a measure of how you're loving. And then Psalm 52, 8 says, But I am like an olive tree, flourishing in the house of God. I trust the unfailing love forever and ever. And then Psalm 62, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever is First um, Corinthians 16. So love, love covers a multitude of sins. That's how we can forgive because when our motivation is love, when we understand we have his love and we can give his love and we have compassion and mercy and all those things, it's so much easier. But the world's looking, they don't know. They don't know. Love is powerful. I've seen people stay alive so much longer at my work than when they're truly loved and tended to. Every sign is pointing that they should not be still with us. Every sign. I'm talking from their weight to their not eating to their respirations to their uh, pr blood pressure. Everything should be indicating. And we're just like, whoa, because of love. Love. They have someone in that house that is doting over them, loving them saying kind things, tending to him, taking care of him, and it is mind-blowing. And I always tell people, don't ever rule out love. It is powerful. It is powerful. And it saves, right? What do they, we know about a little baby? Human baby will not stay alive if it doesn't receive love. It needs touch. It needs love. And so do we. So do we. All right. There it is, right? There it is. I love that we're clapping. I know it's people that have been in the word and with God a long time. We see that. Yeah, John 3, 16. Yeah, I know it. What? Yeah, I know it. What? But do you know it and are you living it? Right? It's, it's a powerful verse for a reason. And let's recite it all together. What? So God so loved the world that he gave his one only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have life life exactly and i love when um tim tebow put that right he was playing that big game he's some football guy and i don't know what he was playing but he was playing some big game and he put that on his eyelids right you guys know that guy anyway <laughs> but his story that he put it on there because they knew so many people would be watching but it was his way to just be close to god in his game and in his faith and and stay focused and um people want to know what it was. Millions and millions. I think it was like it blew up the internet. Everybody's Googling, what the heck is John 3.16? 
Everybody does not know John 3.16. We know John 3.16. They don't know it. And they might not know it because we're not sharing it. So get out there and share that verse. God is with them. And so I love that though. That just, I mean, because that's where, right? The icons are. Our idols are on those darn football fields and in the soccer fields and in the basketball courts and everywhere else. And here's this one guy, right? Just trying to just stay pure, trying to just hold on to his faith in the midst of everybody, trying to tear him down build, and build him up with the temptations of the world. And he's like, John three sixteen, And there all those people were that to, wow, I wonder the fruit that came out of that. There's no way to know, but one day we may know. All right, so recap. We have what? Read it with me. We have hope, peace, joy, grace, faith, oh, truth, goodness, <laughs> patience, mercy, protection, freedom, eternity, and love. So pick one of those. Pick one that you know, because we all don't like live all those perfectly. I know we don't, because I'm one of you. I'm, I'm with you. I'm right there walking. Jesus knows he walked and dwelt among us. We're not fooling him. Pick one this weekend, and maybe there's two or three or four or five that you're like, you know, I haven't thought about that in a while. Just focus on that one thing for the week, and just go, I'm going to, I want to just focus on that, and watch how much you'll hear from God, and watch him, um, that fruit continue to build up in you, and him over, him over, oh, that fruit, that part his attribute overshadow your life in that way i promise it will and then we have we know we love jesus we talk with him hope in him rejoice in him call on him trust him thank him thank him we don't be like those nine lepers thank him sit with him and love him